Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So how will Ethereum scale? That's what we're talking about today. We're gonna to talk about Ethereum 2.0, Casper, Plasma, sharding, all that kind of stuff. So before we jump into that, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the like button down below. That really helps these videos get found so that more people can learn how to build blockchain technology. So how will Ethereum scale? How will it become this platform that can support industrial strength applications that require a lot of throughput? And let's look at the problems that prevent the network from scaling right now and the solutions that are proposed by the Ethereum Foundation for Ethereum 2.0 that will make it a much better platform for mass adoption of blockchain technology. So the problems that exist on the network right now fundamentally you know, fall into a few categories. The first is the number of transactions per second. So right now the network is advertised to have you know, a maximum transaction count of around 15 transactions per second. Now in reality, it's usually a little less than this, but that's sort of the advertised number and we'll just kind of go with that. This is a current limiting factor of the network, I'll be honest with that. But it's not a limiting factor for all use cases. You know, there are some use cases now that just need the blockchain as a settlement layer and don't need a high transaction volume or a high number of transactions per second. But if you wanted to build a blockchain or have a blockchain based application that processed, you know, uh, transactions like Visa does, you know, Visa advertises that they can do 45,000 transactions per second, it's like 35,000, 45,000. It's a lot, a lot of transactions per second. You know, the network as it exists now won't quite live up to those expectations or requirements. So why exactly does, you know, a limited number of transactions per second prevent the network from scaling? Well, if you have a limited number of transactions per second, let's say 15, if there's a lot of traffic on the network or a lot of transactions occurring, the transactions per second essentially is a bottleneck. So if I can only do 15 per second and you know a thousand transactions are coming in, well, it backs up everyone else in the queue um, and they have to wait in order for their transactions to be confirmed and submitted on the network. So you might remember a game called CryptoKitties that clogged up the network. It was very famous for doing this because a lot of people were part of trying to buy digital cats and the network slowed down as a result. You know, people who wanted to send Ether just from one account to another had to wait because everyone was using the CryptoKitties application. In addition to transactions per second, another limiting factor is block time. And this is the amount of time it takes in order for a transaction to be included in a block. See, the blockchain is, you know, comprised of bundles of records or transactions into things called blocks. You know, these are the groups of records that are chained together to make up the blockchain. And it takes a certain amount of time for a transaction to be confirmed on the network and mined into a block. So whenever I send Ether from one account to another, say from my account to yours, it takes time for that transaction to be included in a block. And right now that transaction time is, you know, maybe around 15 seconds, maybe a little bit less. So when you have, you know, a block, a specific block time, you know, the amount of time it takes for your transaction to get included in a block, regardless of how many you're even on the network at any given time, even if I'm the only transaction occurring, it still takes a fixed link for that transaction to be included on the actual blockchain. So between the transactions per second, the block time, and also just the general you know, duplication of responsibilities across the network, and all these things really limit the speed of processing on the blockchain. So those are the problems. So let's look at the solutions that are proposed by the Ethereum Foundation to you know, create a network that's gonna support uh, you know, mass adoption. So let's look at the different strategies for scaling Ethereum. And I want to talk about two kind of different categories here. There's layer one solutions and layer two solutions. Now layer one solutions are basically improvements to the Ethereum protocol itself. And layer two solutions are kind of an extra layer on top of this that still use layer one, but provide some speed of processing that don't necessarily require fundamental changes to the layer one network itself. As far as layer one solutions go, the first thing I want to mention is sharding. So if you think about the current network as it is, you know, every node on the network has a copy of the data or the ledger and all the code, all the smart contracts on the entire network. So if I'm a node, you're a node, we both have the same data. That's part of the power of the network. That's what makes it secure. But that makes it also slow. So like I said earlier, when I'm creating a transaction, no matter how many people are on the network, I actually have to wait sequentially uh, for that transaction to finish before the next one goes. So a solution to this is what's called sharding, right? So instead of every single, you know, network on the node working together, we can break those responsibilities down into smaller groups of nodes. So, you know, a certain percentage of the network can be responsible, 
and another certain percentage of the network can be responsible. And what this allows us to do is actually do concurrent transaction confirmation. So right now it's, it's in sequence. So you have to wait for one transaction to finish for the next one, for the next one, for the next one. With sharding, we can actually do things at the same time and you know divide the entire network up into smaller chunks that will share responsibilities but can do things in parallel. And that's a big benefit there. So the next one is uh, uh, Casper or proof of stake. You might have heard of these things. So currently, this you know this is talking about a consensus algorithm. And currently, you know Ethereum is on a proof of work model, just like, much like Bitcoin. So what that does is you know as it relates to mining. So basically, uh, whenever I create a transaction on the Ethereum network, it has to be mined to get into a block. Basically, you know these nodes, these mining nodes, compete to complete cryptographic puzzles. Uh, in order to secure the transactions on the network. But what proof of stake does is, is a little different. So it's, 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 it's a consensus algorithm, well, like proof of work, but it requires people to stake Ether in order to become validators that validate the transactions on the network. So what proof of stake does, or Casper, is it reduces the block time. That's the big benefit to scaling. There's other benefits, but that's what it does. So earlier when I said that, you know, there's a certain amount of time it takes for any transaction to get completed on the network to get included in the block. So the Ethereum Foundation says that Casper or proof of stake will reduce that amount of time that it takes for a transaction to get included in a block. So another thing I want to mention in this category is uh, EUASM or Ethereum Flavored Web Assembly. And what this does is it actually speeds up or replaces the EVM. So right now you have a virtual machine if you're running an Ethereum node that does all the computations that you know executes smart contract code that um, you know creates transactions things like that, and EWASM is basically there to uh, kind of replace the EVM as it is with something much faster. And I've got another video that talks about that if you want to check that out. Um, and actually, I have another video about this that kind of explains that more in detail. I won't go into all the details here in this video, but I want to mention that as something else that can give us a performance boost on the network. All right, so those are the highlights of layer one solutions. Let's look at layer two solutions. So layer two um, is talking about solutions that aren't just a part of this fundamental layer of the blockchain itself. It's, it's talking about you know, adding scalability solutions on top of the settlement layer that rely upon it, but enhance its capability and you know, provide some speed that you can't just get from using the layer one by itself. So a couple of these uh, are ones that I want to mention. The first one is Plasma, and this is something that you know the Ethereum Foundation talks about. You can read Vitalik's blogs where he talks about this. So basically, what Plasma does is it splits the network up into a bunch of smaller blockchains or side chains that still rely upon the main chain as a settlement layer. What it does is that you get all the uh, you know speed of processing distributed across all these other blockchain. You're not going to talk about concurrency. You're talking about all these other kinds of things. Um, we can do that. We can offload some of these computational resources to smaller blockchains, and we can have a massive web of these things that will share some of the computational responsibility and will also be secure, but still rely upon layer one Ethereum protocol to have the ultimate security and source of truth. Now, the next thing I want to mention in here are state channels. And this is something that you can actually do now with Ethereum. So basically what state channels allow you to do is open up a two-way communication um, with your dApps, you know, with the blockchain that allows, you know, users to basically, you know, interact with one another in a secure way off-chain and make a bunch of transactions back and forth in a closed, trustless manner. And the final result of those transactions gets, you know, uh, uh, included on the blockchain. So let's take a use case, for example. Let's say we want to trade, you know, money back and forth based upon some more live updating event, right? And I send you $10, you send me $5, I send you $2 back, and then I get, you know, $10 or whatever, right? Basically, we don't have to include every single one of those calculations on the blockchain, right? We can just take the sum or the result of all those transactions and include that final transaction on the blockchain. So that's a layer two solution where we can open a state channel that's very fast and we can communicate between each other. Um, and then we can, and we can you know, record that final result on the blockchain. So that's an overview of some possible layer two solutions. Now, in reality, um, at the end of the day, in order to 
create this platform that you know provides a big industrial strength use case with a lot of throughput, it's going to be a combination of all of these different approaches in order to create dApps that are really fast and do what we need them to do in order for consumers to use them widely and reach mass adoption. And you can actually check out this article where Vitalik is, uh, you know, interviewed, uh, talking about, you know, scaling network to millions of transactions per second, and even says it's going to be a combination of these layer one and layer two solutions that accomplish this. So I hope you all like that video. Leave a comment down in the comment section below if there's anything else that I missed or that you want to hear about. And be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also click the thumbs up button down below. That really helps these videos get found so that more people can learn how to build blockchain technology. So I'm going to sign off for now. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.